Question number seven. The image of the iceberg in lines 20 through 22 is that of a what and a what. Let's take a look at the lines in question. The widths of these white peaks spar with the sun. Its weight, the iceberg, dares upon a shifting stage and stands and stares. So we have the width of the iceberg's white peaks sparring with the sun. The iceberg is daring its weight upon the stage, and it's also standing and staring. Let's look at our choices and keep in mind that if one part is wrong, the whole choice is wrong. A, a playwright and a spectator. We don't have anything that makes us think that the iceberg is the playwright. The iceberg is on the stage, but a playwright is the one who writes a play, not the actor. So eliminate A. B, a mortal and a deity. This doesn't fit. We can't support it, so cross out B. C, a victim and a judge. Again, this doesn't fit. There isn't anything to make us think that there is a victim or a judge here, so no. D, child and an adult. Same here. There's no support for this at all. E, a performer and an adversary. We do have the iceberg daring its weight upon a shifting stage, so we can say that this image is that of a performer, and we have the iceberg sparring with the sun, or the white peaks of the iceberg sparring with the sun. So sparring is a term that can refer to boxing or engaging in an argument, and these are activities that you might do with an adversary, or an enemy or opponent. So we can say that there's an image here of the iceberg as an adversary since it's sparring with the sun. So E, performer and an adversary, is the best answer out of the choices that we have. Question number eight. All of the following convey a striking visual effect produced by the iceberg except lines what? So let's look through all of these. A, lines 13 through 15. Here we have the iceberg rises and sinks again. It's glassy pinnacles, correct elliptics in the sky. And then 28 through 30. Goodbye, we say. Goodbye. The ship steers off where waves give in to one another's waves and clouds run in a warmer sky. C, 20 through 21, here we have the widths of these white peaks spar with the sun. And then D, 3 and 4, although it stood stock still like a cloudy rock and all of the sea were moving marble. It here refers to the iceberg. The iceberg stood stock still like a cloudy rock. And finally, E, lines 17 through 19, these lines read, The curtain is light enough to rise on finest ropes that airy twists of snow provide. So if we read through all of these, B, lines 28 through 30, are the only lines that are clearly not giving us any image of the iceberg at all. Here we have the speaker saying goodbye to the iceberg and steering away from it, and the imagery is of waves running into waves and of clouds in a warmer sky. So the correct answer is B, lines 28 through 30. Question number nine, like jewelry through the word itself in lines 24 through 26 emphasizes the iceberg's what? So let's read these lines in context. The iceberg cuts its facets from within. Like jewelry from a grave, it saves itself perpetually and adorns only itself. Perhaps the snows, which so surprise us lying on the sea. And now let's look at our choices. A, elegant but dangerous qualities. There isn't anything inherently dangerous about something from a grave, and there isn't anything else in lines 24 through 26 specifically that could be construed as dangerous, so A won't work. B, serendipitous appeal. Serendipitous means occurring or discovered by chance in a happier, beneficial way, and there isn't anything here that indicates that the iceberg was discovered by happy chance, so this doesn't really make sense. C, obsolete value. No obsolete means no longer used because it's out of date. This doesn't make sense. Jewelry from a grave would still have value, so it wouldn't be considered obsolete, and this won't work. D, connection to human suffering. There isn't anything specifically about jewelry from a grave that connects the iceberg to human suffering. This doesn't make sense either. Cross out D, and that leaves us with E, beauty but permanence. This is the best answer. Jewels are beautiful, so comparing the iceberg to jewelry implies beauty, and it says it saves itself perpetually, which indicates permanence. So of the choices we have, E, beauty but permanence, is the best answer. Question number 10. The final three lines, icebergs, through the word indivisible, suggest that icebergs can what? Let's look at the lines in question. Icebergs behoove the soul, both being self-made from elements least visible, to see them so, fleshed, fair, erected, indivisible. A, warn of unforeseen dangers. There isn't anything about danger or anything dangerous in these lines, so A won't work. B, remind us of the passing of time. There's not anything about time passing in these lines either, so no, cross out B. 
C. Force us to encounter our spiritual past. We don't have any indication of a spiritual past. The soul, like the iceberg, is self-made from elements least visible, but there isn't any indication of a past spirituality or a forced encounter, so C doesn't work. D. Provide insights for human observers. We have a comparison here between the icebergs and the soul. The soul here implies humanity or being human, and making a comparison between the two implies that insight can be gained by doing so. So this answer is the best so far. E. Unite disparate spirits. We don't have disparate or essentially different spirits mentioned here. We have elements least visible, erected or constructed into something indivisible, but we don't have anything to make us think that these are disparate spirits that are being united. So this doesn't work. And the best answer we have here is still D, provide insight for human observers. Question number 11. The last two lines of each stanza comprise what? Let's look at these three sets of lines. We have... Are you aware an iceberg takes repose with you and when it wakes may pasture on your snows? And then spar with the sun, its weight the iceberg dares upon a shifting stage and stands and stares. And the last ones, both being self-made from elements least visible, to see them so fleshed fair, erected indivisible. A, an epiphany. This would be a sudden insight or a new and clearer way to see something. This doesn't really work. Only the third set of lines might possibly somehow be construed as an epiphany, but certainly not the second set, which is just a continuation of the imagery in the stanza. So A won't work. B, an antithesis. This is when two opposite ideas are put together in a sentence to achieve a contrasting effect. We don't really have this in any of the sets, so this doesn't work. C, a refrain. No, these lines don't repeat, so C won't work. D, a couplet. A couplet is a set of two rhyming lines that usually share the same meter. These sets of lines do rhyme, and the meter is very close in each set, so this answer is the best so far. E, a restatement of the theme. No, we don't have a restatement of the theme in these lines, so the best answer is D, a couplet. Question number 12. The tone of the speaker is best described as what? A, whimsical. This isn't a completely bad answer. There are places in the poem where you might consider the speaker to be whimsical or playful, but it's not the best answer as long as you have B, admiring. This is a very good answer because the speaker is clearly and consistently admiring the iceberg throughout the poem. Let's mark B and then take a look at the rest. C, sentimental. There's nothing particularly sentimental about this poem, so this isn't a very good answer. D, ironic. The speaker seems sincere, so this answer won't work. Elegiac. This would refer to poetry that is either following a very specific rhythmic pattern or poetry that is like an elegy. We're talking about tone here, not meter, and this poem is not like an elegy or something written for the dead. This answer is incorrect, and that leaves us with B, admiring, as the best response.